Ephesians 4. <clears throat> if you, boy, I'm about to lose my voice. You hear that? I don't know what's going on. I'm about, I am, huh? Yeah. I am about to lose my voice. I felt it go there on that last song. And, uh,. hope it's nothing nothing too serious Ephesians chapter 4 <clears throat> you know what I'm, I'm I think I'm going to mind the Lord I, I think for some reason Um, while we were singing a while ago, it seemed like the Lord was um, putting in my heart uh, to talk about the rapture. I don't know why, but I cannot get it out of my mind. And... Uh, I thought, no, I'm just going to stick with my notes and do that. That's what I'm expected to do. That's what we do. We follow the notes. And, but I, I, even as I'm standing here, I'm looking at my notes in Ephesians going, nope. Talk about the rapture. I have no idea why, but uh, I'm just going to fly by the seat of my pants is what they, how they refer to it. I don't know exactly what that means but that's what I'm going to do so turn to 1st Thessalonians 4 um, and then go back to Ephesians there is something in Ephesians that I think is relevant here um, in fact let's let's go back even further than that let's go to the beginning um, turn to Genesis chapter 2, and hold your place there, we'll, we'll look at 1 Thessalonians 4, okay? 1 Thessalonians 4 it seems it to be the most, um, I would say, spot on, straightforward, this is what it is concerning what is referred to as the rapture. Some people get that out of shape, because I say rapture. Um, and they say, well, the rapture is not in the Bible. And I say, well, yeah, it is. No, the word rapture is not. Okay, I know, the, I know the English word rapture is not there. But there is a language called Latin. And the word rapture is a Latin word. It derives from the Latin word and in a... Latin Bible, not a Catholic Bible, but a Latin language Bible. The word caught up would be the Latin word rap, rapture or something, another. Okay, I don't know the exact, you can look it up. Um, Google Translate, translate.google.com and you can look that up, okay? So it the word rapture is the, the word, it is a correct word to describe what is going to take place. It is also, it is, so it's, it has, goes by different names. Rapture, the translation, I've used that before. Um, the Catching away, some people refer to it that way. Um, it is the resurrection, and, and I'll say it is the first resurrection. There are two resurrections. Can anybody tell me what the second resurrection is for? Does anybody know? Huh? Huh? I didn't hear. He's judging 
the living and the dead uh, who are unrighteous. The second judgment is God judging all of the sinners. And we're talking from the beginning of time until the end of time. Uh, can you imagine? There's right now, they say we just passed the 8 billion people mark on this earth. 8 billion people, yes. Yeah. Uh, listen, I got to go to heaven here. Get, it, um, yeah, like trying to deal, like trying to deal with an airline when they uh, bump you off your flight. So anyway, um, it's referred to the rapture, being caught up, the translation, the resurrection, the first resurrection. It is all of those things combined, the, and that first resurrection is a resurrection of the saints. It is, and it is resurrecting their dead bodies, but also those who are alive are, are going to be translated from this earthly body to their new immortal body. So we look at 1 Thessalonians 4, um, and I, I tell you what, I found, I never thought this before, but if we look in 1 Thessalonians, there is a reference in every chapter of Thess First Thessalonians to the appearing of the Lord. Uh, if you look at, uh, let's see here, in, in First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So there's a reference to uh, the, the rapture there. In chapter 2, um, it's usually near the end of the chapter. Um, yeah, look at verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. I, I tell you what, I know what that's like. When Satan, and I just, I, w that time we were supposed to go to Kenya, and Jaden and Michaela's passports were were deemed no good. They were not going to let them out of the country. So we just didn't go. And, and, and the next day, I mean, I'm just kind of like, God, I'm just really upset here. How could you let this happen? And the Lord spoke to me kind of like, in, in saying like, uh, Mike, if, if Satan can hinder Paul, who are you? And then I remembered that. And I looked that verse up and here it is. Satan hindered the apostle Paul. How does, how does that even happen? God allows it to happen. Now verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not ye or are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. It's like what I was saying this morning uh, before, the, before the preaching. I said, I, I, I want to see everybody that I'm seeing right now. I want to see you in heaven. I don't want to be looking down. Isaiah 66, I think, tells us that we're going to be able to see people in the lake of fire. And I do not want to see any one of you in the lake of fire for eternity. I want to see you around the throne of glory. Amen? Look in chapter 3. Uh, you're going to have another reference to it. Let's see here. Yeah. Verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love what one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end, he may establish, which basically means establish. But the STA part of that is a Latin prefix. And it basically means it's stand still. It doesn't move that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. There's another one. And let me just focus on that word here, established for just a minute. He may establish your hearts unblameable. I believe that God can bring a person to a state or a status in their life where 
they know that they believe the Word of God, they believe Jesus Christ died for their sins, they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they believe that He is God in the flesh, and they believe every word of God is pure, and they, they are never, ever, in this life or the next, going to change their mind or have their heart turned away. I believe God can establish somebody in the belief and they will they cannot be shaken that's what i believe and that's to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god now chapter four describes uh what's going to happen so in, in uh, chapter four we'll pick it up around verse 14 for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We just read that in the previous chapter, that Jesus will come with all his saints. Um, for this we say unto you, verse 15, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And in this case, the word prevent, let me pull up, uh, yeah, the definition prevent, to go before or to proceed, to precede. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. That's from Psalm 119. Webster used, to, Webster used the Bible, the King James Bible, often in his definitions. That's why I like Webster's dictionary, the original. But anyway, in other words, we are not going to go to heaven before they do. So apparently there was people thinking that if they weren't alive when Jesus came that they wouldn't get to go that he would only take those who were alive and and paul is establishing this idea that even no even if they've been dead a thousand years two thousand years three thousand years it doesn't matter they're not they're not going to get missed over they're going to be taken up first and those who are alive and remain on that day will not precede them. They're going to go after them. So, he says in verse 16, this is where we usually, this is what we usually quote to people. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That word is important. Of course, all of them are, but this one. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In other words, he's not coming down to touch the earth yet. We're going to meet him in the first heaven. First heaven being the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, and so the Lord will descend to a place in the atmosphere. He is going to be in clouds clothed with clouds, covered with clouds, clouds surrounding him. Uh, he's going to be encompassed with a great cloud of witnesses. When that happens, the dead rise first, then those who are alive on that day will be caught up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I, I just will not argue with somebody on what I think they might be wrong in or what they might think I might be wrong in or what I just won't do it. Um, we're not supposed to. We're supposed to comfort one another with these words. Now, anybody that disagrees with me on, on this issue, you are more than welcome to disagree with me. Just don't ever call here and try to tell me how wrong I am to try to get me to bite your bait. Because I won't do it. And uh, if, you, if you press me too much, I will say, God bless you, have a good day. I will talk to you sometime in the future. And I'll hang the phone up. I've done it before. Because I've had people that all they want to do is fight. All they want to do is argue and fight and, and try to show me how wrong I was. So anyway, that's, that's verse number one. Now, I had you go to uh, Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis and um, look at something there that, is, that relates to what the rapture in part is. There's several aspects to it. It's the resurrection, resurrection of the dead. It's the day that he sets captivity free. So Genesis chapter 2. And I want, you to, I want you to... Adam now is Christ. In, in the foreshadowing of Genesis 2, Adam is a foreshadow of the second Adam. The last Adam. So, here's what God said in uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And when you see God say this, refer in your mind first to Adam and then to Jesus Christ. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now he's saying that, number one, concerning Adam. Typologically, uh, this is God speaketh once. In God speaketh twice, he's saying of his only begotten son, it's not good that the man, Jesus Christ, should be alone. I will make him and help meet. And let's look that word up. The word meet. Uh, Latin, convenio. It means fit, suitable, proper, qualified, uh, adapted as to use or purpose. Um, so it basically means uh, I will make him and help suitable or qualified or proper or whatever for him. In other words, the, the bride is going to be compatible with the bridegroom. They're going to be in agreement. There's never going to be an argument. There's not going to be um, glasses thrown across the room, shattering against the wall. There's no, not going to be a divorce or anything like that. It, that's, that's what God made Eve into. She is compatible and appropriate and suitable for Adam. And then the bride of Christ is going to be suitable for Jesus Christ. Which is why salvation is a gift given to those who want salvation. Okay? Uh, I've, I've known people that tried pushing salvation on to people that they love. And when you do that, you're going to find out eventually it will not work. You cannot force someone to be saved and they just give in simply because they don't want to fight anymore. And I... I yeah, I've seen that happen. Uh, so anyway, so he's going to make and help meet for him. 
So in verse 21, um, and, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. It, to me, it's interesting. In English, it's man and woman. Man is in both words. In um, Hebrew, if I remember right, the Hebrew word here for man is ish, and woman, it's isha. I think. Could be wrong, been wrong before. Uh, but anyway, that's not a big deal. But here's what I'm getting at. And Adam said in verse 23, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. How did you and I get to be part of this bride of Christ? It was a wound in, in his side where the blood and water issued forth. Uh, I, think that, I think that plays into it. God put a wound in Adam. And there's a wound in Christ uh, in about the same place. Uh, but anyway, we have been made partakers with Christ. The Bible says that when the time comes and we are translated and resurrected, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we're going to be changed in a moment to the very appearance of Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, we are his body. Okay, so what what applies here that Adam is saying about his wife Eve applies also to Christ and the church. And I'll prove that in a moment. So verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Well, think about what Jesus did. He left his father. Uh, Paul said in Galatians that Jerusalem above, which is free, is the mother of us all. So he left heaven. He left his father. He came down. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So now... Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. There we go. And look at what the Apostle Paul said. Oh, let's start verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves therefore unto your own husbands. Uh, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. And I, and I, I literally think of this illustration. This is Christ. This is Christ. And this is the church. Uh, we are his body. We are uh, everything that the Bible says about the body. We are that. We are his body, we're his blood, uh, and think about it, the body receives nourishment from the head, doesn't it? The body receives sight from the head, the body receives hearing from the head, the body receives oxygen, air, from the one, two, three holes cut in there. So we get plenty of it. Okay. That's the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All right. Um, and everything that the body needs, everything that the body does comes from the head. The brain is in the head. It's not down in the body. It's up in the head, meaning Christ is the... Christ is the grown-up here. He's the adult. He's the one that when he makes decisions, it's final. It's done. It's over with. The head moves the body, not the other way around. 
The head is in charge. Um, well, I was going to say something else too along with that line. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, that's, that's the way. Oh, there is an exception to this. Where are our lungs? Where's the Holy Spirit? Down, down here in the body. See, everything from here up is in heaven. But from here down, this is all on the earth. And the beauty of it is, is God didn't put the lungs here like gills. Okay? He put the lungs here, two of them, Old Testament, New Testament. Put them down here because the spirit is with the body. The spirit is what's giving the body life. Amen. I like that stuff. I don't know about you, but that's, that stuff just gets me. So anyway, uh, moving right along here. Uh, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave. That's the true meaning of love, is you give unconditionally. He gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. If your Bible's clean, you're going to be clean. If your Bible's dirty, you're going to be dirty. Simple as that. Um, uh, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his his uh, uh, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord his church. Trust me. Tr well, trust God. Jesus is always going to take care of his body. He's always going to breathe. He's always going to give us plenty of air. He's always going to hear what needs to be heard, see what needs to be seen, feel what needs to be felt, taste what needs to be tasted. He's going to, uh, uh, he's going to move the body. He's going to take it out of harm's way. He's going to do all of those things. That's what the head does for the body. Uh, if the body is severed from the head, neither one of them. Okay, you can't live that way. Now, verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Now, here's what he said. This is a great mystery. But every time you see the word mystery, it tells you what the mystery is. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, what we just read, verse 31 for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. That's what we just read in Genesis 2. What Adam said. Adam says this. He says it to Eve. He is a foreshadow then of Christ. And the purpose of. One of the purposes of the rapture event. Is to join the body with the head. The two are going to be one person we are going to be the body of jesus christ hallelujah that means that we're not going to die anymore we're not going to sin anymore we're not going to lust anymore amen we don't we won't even crave chicken or chinese food or anything like that okay uh, and so that's basically the, the, the teaching behind it, the me, one of the meanings behind the rapture. Why is God doing this? He's doing this right now. The Holy Spirit is uh, like uh, Eleazar, uh, Abraham's servant who goes out to find the wife suitable for Isaac. And Eleazar goes out and is faithful and he finds the right woman and she's willing to go. That's the key. Got to be willing. You got to want to go. All right. So there's that part of it. 
Now let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. I'm enjoying this. I still don't, I have no idea why God laid this on my heart. I don't, but it's God's service. It's God's book. It's God's place. So we'll just do what God, God said. Now, here is an explanation of the resurrection. Um, and starting in verse 35, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, you start in, yeah, like I say, in verse 35, you're, to get the whole picture. Let's get all the meat on the bone, all right? So now he says, verse 35, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Good question. Paul says, thou fool. And apparently, whoever is saying this is saying it facetiously like, Paul, that's, that's so stupid. You mean they're going to come up out of the grave, worms all over them? You know, that's what apparently whoever brought this up, that's apparently they had something like that in mind. Come on, Paul, and what, what kind of body are they going to have? It's been in the grave for years. It's, it's turned to bones. There's nothing left. Paul says, thou fool. That which... Um, that which thou sowest is not quickened, quicken means made alive, except it die. So how can you be resurrected? You got to die. And in the case of those who die before the rapture, that's what we all, the, the, the way to get to heaven is you got to die. It's just plain and simple. So, I don't like that. I want to be translated, not resurrected, but I don't get to make that choice. So, I'm going to have to die one of these days. And this is how, this is the best way to handle the death of someone that you know is in heaven is you face it with the idea that this had to happen so that they could have their new body now. Now they can live forever. Now they're no longer in pain. They're not, they're not in sorrow anymore. Uh, and we get all of his money in the inheritance, all right? But anyway, that's, that's how you deal with it. That's how uh, when my dad died, um, my mom and one of her friends, they were asking me, you know, are you going to preach the funeral? And I had, I had time to think about it. And I said, no, I don't, I don't think I can. And one of mom's friends, uh, she, she questioned me later about it. And she said, are you sure, uh, that, you know, maybe you won't, uh, um, you, you'll regret that you didn't preach his funeral. And I told her flat out, I said, I, don't, I won't regret something that I know I cannot do. And I was right on that because I, I was holding everything together for mom, um, helping her with making decisions and phone calls and things like that. But uh, when we were at the church down in DeSoto where mom and dad went, uh, that's when it hit me. I broke down then. I, in fact, I went and got out of everybody's way and I just let it out. 
And uh, so I, I knew, I know to this day I couldn't have done it. But we had a little time. We were going to bury him down at our, sort of our family cemetery, Marcus Hill Baptist Church, Marcus Hill Cemetery in uh, Enola, Arkansas. And um, so we drove down there and the night... Uh, I'm going to do the uh, the graveside service, and the night before the service, God gave me exactly what I needed, and it was from Psalms: "They that sow in tears shall shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him." And the Holy Spirit said, "Mike, you're not burying your dad; you're planting the seed." And I said, God, I like that. And that's what I did the next day. I planted a seed. And every now and then I go and check on that seed. Okay? Um, same way with my granddaughter. Okay, that was harder. Um, but anyway, that's what... He, that's what the analogy is, is that it's just like putting seed into the ground. On just about every seed, there is a hard shell, isn't there? Corn, there's a hard shell around corn. When you eat popcorn, you always get it stuck right here. Okay? That shell is this flesh. And that shell has got to come off or that seed will not grow it will not it won't do anything that's why you can store seeds for years and i mean years and years and years and years as long as you don't let something eat it or something get in it to rot it keep it dry keep it out whatever you can have seed i guess hundreds of years old you can plant seeds Okay, it, because of that shell, it's over. It's protecting what's inside. The real, listen, the real you's on the inside of you. Right? What's on the outside is nothing but something that's going to rot off. So that's what he's saying here. Thou fool, except thou, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. But bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. And just about every seed looks different than another type of seed. Uh, I got tickled at um, Pastor Lordson Rock. Uh, I brought him out to the house to shoot guns. He's a pretty good shot. And then I took him out for a walk in the woods. You know, it was fall and everything was pretty. And we walked in the woods for a while, and I showed him this and that, and and we come out of there, and we had beggar lice, all of them, all. Of, and he's going, "What in the world is this?" I said, "They want a free trip to India. These are beggar lice." He said, "What are they?" I said, "Just pick them off their seeds." And I said, that's how God designed them to be planted in different places. They latch on to, to clothing or to fur. And as a deer or something walks through the woods, it picks some up. And it walks a hundred yards away and rubs up against a tree and drops it. And now it's going to grow another one there. That, God's great. You're good, God. At knowing how to plant stuff. So, but verse 38, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Uh, and that's important when it comes to understanding the idea of angels mating with human women, because they have a body. Angels have a body. The Bible says they have a body. It says it right here, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial Bodies. Celestial means of the heavens. It's where we get the word ceiling from. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. 
but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. And so if you, if you match that verse with verse 38, if it has a body, it has seed that made it. It has DNA. We have DNA, fish have DNA, beggar lice has DNA, uh, beggars out at Walmart have DNA, <laughs> okay. and angels do. And here we go, God does. How do I know? Because I'm his son. Amen? I am, thank you. I am God's son. I was born again from him, and I rightfully call him my father. Amen. There's a, so he says in verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star dippeth from another star in glory. In other words, like brightness. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now this is what Paul calls it here. He's not really making a reference to the marriage. Or, you know, the, the, uh, along with the rapture, I believe, the restoration of Israel. But he's talking here about the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. And, and by the way, it has to corrupt. That seed has to rot off. When he, and, the only, and what happens? It has to get wet. That's why it, it's why it rains in the spring. So you put the seed in the ground. That seed eventually will get wet. The water will cause that, that uh, shell to rot off. That's why he said it is sown in corruption. But it's raised in incorruption. It is sown in weakness. Because the flesh cannot do anything. But it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body. And is raised a spiritual body. That's why I keep saying... This is, this is what's on the inside of you. Just like the wheat. They take the wheat and get rid of that junk that's on the outside of it and grind that wheat into flour. That's where you get bread and biscuits from. That's where the good stuff is. And so he says in verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, oh, here's the Adam. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul by God breathing into his nostrils. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In other words, God breathed life into Adam and gave him a soul. But Christ is the one who's going to quicken his spirit and raise him up. A quickening spirit. He's going to raise people from the dead. How be it? Verse 46. That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. And you have that illustration right here in front of you in your Bible. You have the law which pertains to the natural, the body, the commandments that, you know, do not commit adultery, do not steal, you know, bear false. Those deal with the flesh. Here's the natural Here's the, here's the spiritual right here, the New Testament. And it's in order. It's in this order. Exactly. So he gave us the natural body first and then the spiritual body. So verse 45, and so it is written. The first, oh, I already read that. Verse 46, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The word Adam is related to the word Edom. And Adam and Edom mean red, like red clay. So when God named Adam, he named him dirt. Adam, your name is dirt. That's what you are. You're made from the earth. You're earthy. And so... Uh, the second man is Lord from heaven, even as the earthy, such are also they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And let me throw this in very quickly. This is why there is not one thing in this earth that exists that you must have in order to be saved. In other words, 
drinking the wine and eating the, the wafer from the Catholic Church does not save you and cannot save you because it's, it is of this earth. It was made on this earth. It was baked on this earth. The grapes grew on this earth. The wheat grew on this earth. Everything about it is from the earth. It cannot save you. You do not need a wafer to save you. You do not need a cup of wine to save you. You don't even need a church building to save you. You are not saved by anything in this world. You're saved by one thing that's in heaven. Amen? That's what he's saying here. He's saying uh, that which is natural and then afterward that which is spiritual. So if you are Adam, you're of the earth, earthy. But if you are of Christ, you are a son of God from heaven. Your birth is from heaven. Heaven is your mother. That's what Paul said. Now, verse 50. Here we go. Now, this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We're not going to heaven in this body. Hallelujah. So now he says it. Um, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Oh, he says a mystery again. I wonder what the mystery is. Well, he's going to tell it to you. We shall not all sleep. Sleep means death. The Bible says they sleep the sleep of death. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. There it's where this verse and 1 Thessalonians 4 agree. The twinkling of an eye, how fast is that? Some people are going to blink and people are going to be gone. Yes, ma'am. Uh-uh. What did Chris do wrong to get left behind? <laughs> I'm just I'm just teasing with you. It it'll be that quick. And if people who think that they're gonna wait till the last minute, they ain't go to, they ain't got a minute. They got less than a second. And it's going to be that quick. It's not going to be time for, okay, God, I'll do it now. Uh-uh. You had your chance. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So here, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, they are in a perfect agreement that the dead rise first and their bodies don't look like something from, uh, what's that show, Walking Walking dead, they don't look like zombies. Okay? They're gonna, we don't know exactly what they're gonna, but we're all gonna look like Christ. And so, um, the, the, in, in, like I say, they agree. The dead in Christ, in both places, they rise first, they're transformed, and then those who are alive, who are not asleep at that time, will be changed. In a moment, our vile body is going to be done away with and a new body is going, to, is going to present itself. It's going to be there. And, and he says, just like when you plant a seed, what comes out of the ground doesn't look like the seed you planted. Thank God. It looks like something much better, much more beautiful. It will be different. How different? Completely different is all I can tell you. But it will be glorious. Amen. So he said in verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory.
Amen. You want to see a picture of that? Turn to Job. No, uh, Jonah. Turn to Jonah. There's a picture in your Bible. God draws a picture of everything. <laughs> this is reason 8,922 of why I use only the King James. Because the words match. What we just read, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, wh where did Jesus say that he was going when he died? He said, the sign that you're going to get is the sign from the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be, where? In the heart of the earth. So what does the whale represent? Hell. Okay? Look at verse 17 of chapter 1. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, and what was it going to do? Swallow up, Jonah. Death is swallowed up in victory. Isn't that cool? And then if you read, if you go on to read chapter 2, uh, Jonah spells it out. And he says, I'm in hell. And then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction. Unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. This is Jonah prophesying of Christ being in the heart of the earth. And had I gone with Ephesians tonight, we would have just talked again. It's been a while about what Christ did for those three days that he was in the heart of the earth. And, and who, you know, what was he doing and who was he doing it to and so on. But that is a picture of death being swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. I'm, I'm trying to quote this from memory here, back to First Corinthians. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. Let me put that here. There we go. Almost done. I'll let you go. Verse 56, the stick of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. There's another word there. S-T-E or S-T-A is a Latin prefix, and it means, it's like you took a, 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 a iron spike, and you sledgehammered that thing down into the ground a foot. It ain't going nowhere. And whatever it's hooked to is not going anywhere. And so, as you are established in the Word, here he said, be ye steadfast. And then he tells you what it means, the next word. What does it say? Unmovable. The Bible just defined it way better than I did. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I wrestle with that. I wrestle with defeat. With uh, me saying my, my work does nothing. Nobody listens. Nobody, nobody does anything. And I'm learning that over time, if I just wait, I'll see it. Somebody this morning, after service, came up to me and, she, and said, can I hug you? And I said, sure. And they said, you have no idea how thankful I am for what God has shown you. And what you've been preaching. And I'm like, 
Wow. Um, you always abound. I like how Reg put it one time. Stand up. Reg said, abounding. He said, when I think of the word abounding, he said, I think of a buck deer. When you jump a buck deer and he goes running, he comes to a four-strand barbed wire fence. He don't get on on the ground and try to crawl under it. He bounds over that thing. And he said, that's how it is. He said, well, we're going to be leaping over everything that's trying to get in our way. Amen. Abounding. I hope, I hope whoever God wanted this for, I hope it's a blessing. Father, I love your word. I love every part of it. I thank you for it. I thank you, Lord, for what it means, what it says. Lord, and for the, the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom, God, that you give us through this book. This book is absolutely, undeniably, the very word of God. And it drives away all that's sad and hopeless. And it fills us, Lord, with your goodness and your promises and hope that people like us can still be people that go to heaven, that are your sons, your people, united with you. Jesus, we thank you for being a faithful son of God, that you did things by the book, and that you are our redeemer, and you're our lawyer for our case against, against us. We thank you, Jesus, for being our advocate. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for dwelling in among us, leading us and guiding us and giving us life. We thank you for all of these things. We ask you to bless our week. Bless my family. Bless Alicia. Lord, just go with her and be with her. Give her comfort and give her grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.